Hello and welcome to the final four. Raid Madness is down to its last four epic champions. We're in the semifinals. And here for this round as our guest analyst is the illustrious Hell Hades. Hades, thanks for coming on the channel. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me back on. Um, damn, things have moved on since I last came on, right? They <laughs> have. That's one of the, the first. Yes, yeah, it's, it's looking pretty damn crazy now. Last four. Yeah, you. the last time you were here, we were looking at, I believe, the Ice Golem region in the very first round. So it's been quite a while. Yeah. Um, so we're going to take a look at the bracket, look back a little bit at each region, how we got here, and then we're going to preview the final four. Let's just start with your original region. I believe you were the Ice Golem's peak. And um, so in the last round, in the Epic Eight, we had Godseeker and Eri going up against Deacon Armstrong. And this proved to be a very close matchup. Um, Godseeker and Eri got 46% of the vote here to Deacon Armstrong's 54. So uh, what, um, what do you yeah. think about this? Does this feel like, does this feel fair to you? Does this feel like this should have gone the other way? What do you think about this, uh, this I outcome? Think it's, I think it's probably fair. Like, if I was thinking, you know, which way would I go? I think it's probably just about scraping Deacon into the lead there. It's interesting, though, how close it is. Like, I take it this is just all of the viewers are coming in and just, just bringing their votes, and then basically the winner goes through. That's the way this is working, yeah? Uh, yeah, so this is basically anybody who wants to vote is voting, and yeah. it's just a percentage, so... Yeah, yeah, um, okay, yeah. yeah. So, so 54 to 46... I mean, damn, because really Godseeker is exceptionally good at maybe like one or two areas of the game, whereas Deacon is just usable everywhere in the game. Like, and he's really good everywhere in the game. So for him to sneak through, I think is probably right. And I was trying to remember what I did in terms of my votes. Like I voted right the way through to the, to the end. I can't remember where right. that is. Like, I'd, I'd have to check it out after and see if I ended up with the, with the same champions coming through. But... Yeah, damn. I think Deacon's probably just about right to, to pinch that one. But what's your view anyway? What, which way would you have gone on those two? Um, I've actually called Deacon all the way through. So oh, have you? Yeah, okay. I, I have. And I'm, I'm not, you know, that, that's no secret. Everybody knows I'm a, a Deacon fan. So I do think that uh, in this particular case, I was a little bit surprised at how close it was. Uh, because I think right. one of the things that we're seeing, or I guess I would have been surprised early on, and I'm becoming less and less surprised. Um, I guess what we're seeing in recent rounds, if you look at the Epic Eight, is that we're seeing champions who are very, very strong later in the game at one or two particular things. You know, they offer yeah. really good solutions like Godseeker and Eerie does for Sand Devils Necropolis. And people are valuing that very highly. We're going to see that in some of the other regions as well. Um, we do have Deacon here as more of a generalist, and I think generalists are not being valued as highly. Um, so I, as a free to play player, I'm always looking for value right from the beginning of the game, you know, versatility. That's what I value. But I think a lot of players are just valuing that perfect solution for like the later game content. Yeah. And it's not like he can't get into teams, which are quite high end late game. That's the thing. Like, right. Your seeker is a specialist for a particular area. Like Deacon can, can still compete with legendary champions even when you get towards the late game he's not quite there i don't think he'll be in many of the, the, the absolute top teams but he does compete for a spot so i, I do get why he's kind of like just you know all through there all right so let's drop down and look into the southwest region this is the spider's den and again we're kind of seeing the same kind of matchup here where we have probably a champion that's known as a specialist in demitha right excellent clan boss champion Again, sort of an all-around yeah. champion in Stagnite. This time, the Specialist won. What do you think about this matchup? I mean, it's crazy that she won by so much, actually. Like, 63% is big. I, I do kind of get it, though. She just unlocks Clan Boss so early, and so yeah. easy. And I think people, and, and rightly so, they value that extremely high. And I'd imagine if your viewers are you know, those free-to-play kind of players or, you know, maybe earlier, earlier game players, well, Demitha has a lot more value than Stagnite, in my opinion. Stagnite's a great epic. I, I can understand how he got there. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's the right call. Like, Demitha, I, I think, easily wins that for me as well. There's quite a lot of champions that could do what Stagnite does 
as an epic. Maybe not quite as well, but they can do it. Whereas there's not many champions that can unlock what Demitha unlocks for you. So, yeah, I mean, I, would, I definitely would have gone in the same direction. Let me ask you this, because, you know, every year you run a free-to-play account. Um, yeah. Have you ever pulled the Stagnite, say, in the first month of an account, or versus, say, pulling a Demitha in the first month of the account? Which one do you think snowballs your account harder? Like, is Demitha as valuable early in the game, or do you really need a roster to unlock her? I think the, the thing you need with Demitha to unlock her is actually speed. So she's all of the comps that run Demitha, that you need like 280 ish plus speed to make that work. So that's the thing that will lock you down. I actually don't think it's, it's roster because her and an heiress basically form the comp. And then it's just a case of, do you have some people in there that could do some damage, which, you know, as long as you've got some poisons in the, in the mix, I think you could actually unlock Ultra Nightmare Clan Boss quite quick, probably within a couple of months if you've got Demitha. But what you can't do is get 300 odd speed in a couple of months. Right. And, you know, if I think now I'm free to play, I'm like three months in, I think the best I've got available to me is about 280, 290 on a champion. So that would be the thing that would, would block you. But the thing is, I do think there's maybe six or so good epics that could be your decreased defense champ. And, you know, you've got someone like Duke the Pierce that can do exactly the same as Stagnite slightly in a slightly different format. You know, Deacon that we just spoken about, you've got um, Dicey, you've got Ugo, like there's a whole bunch of different epics that can do the job. Not quite the same, but pretty similar. Whereas, as, as I say, there's only really maybe two epics, and we're seeing both of them actually here, that can really unlock Clan Boss for you in that way. So, yeah, I still, I still would value the Demitha more, I think. I mean, what do you think? Like, on a new account, which, yeah, maybe they, maybe in like the first 20 days, Stagnite's going to give you more value, but I think after that, you, you probably want the Demitha pull over the Stag, in my view. Yeah. I think you're right. And I think the vote was right. Um, I think there's a lot of respect for Stagnite here at 37%. We can see that each round, the matchups are getting closer and closer. Obviously, these are, you know, quarterfinalists. There are only eight champions at this level. Um, I do think the one thing that I find I miss when I don't have a Stagnite, if I have another drop defense champion um, or another um, decrease attack champion, I miss the slow on the A1. Yeah, um, it's that, nice, yeah, that's the skill that I actually miss the most. But I do think in terms of versatility, Demitha is pigeonholed as a clan boss champion, but she's actually really usable in a lot of places. Um, she can provide a lot of sustain for your for your team. She's got a buff extension. She's got a mini cleanse. She's got heals. She's got a little shield. I mean, yeah. she's got a lot in her kit that doesn't get utilized in the unkillable clan boss team. And I think once you factor it all in, I don't know that Stagnite measures up like you said he's more easily replaced but also i think that she's more valuable even early on than you might imagine if you've never pulled her before yeah so i've never pulled her on one of my early free to plays but i did get helicaf when there was a fusion for helicaf on a free to play account and okay he's not the same champion because he's, right. he's slightly more broken but he um i found that i thought i was just getting him for a clan boss comp and he absolutely did that for me. But he also just came in to every single team that I was running. You know, that block damage just came up at the right time. Uh, with someone like Demitha, like you say, she brings a heal as well. There's just so much of the game that when you're trying to get through certain, like just, just progression, really, they really just open stuff up. So yeah, I, I think it's easily the right. And, and this brings us now out of the West. We've got a really interesting matchup here. Going into the final four, we are looking at the one seed, Demitha, up against the three seed from your region, <laughs> which is Deacon Armstrong. Uh, and yeah. this is really interesting to me because, you know, we were just talking about specialists versus generalists. And, and we had the specialists come out of the bottom half. The generalists come out of the top half. But the really interesting thing is that these two champions work perfectly together, don't they? It's like they <laughs> actually yeah. work really well together. Um, yeah. So in this particular matchup, before we get into like favorites or anything like that, what do you think a free to play player should be looking at when they're considering, say, these two champions? Like, what, where's the value in each one coming from? Yeah, so I guess, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're both so different, right? <laughs> they're, they're so different in terms of what they bring. So I feel like Deacon really unlocks most of the game 
and he unlocks it really quickly. So as soon as you've got his ascension up to level three, which in the first few days is hard to do, but after that, you start to get the tools to make that happen. He just becomes so valuable everywhere in, in the game. So turn me to control is king. You know, decreased defense lets your nukers do some work. Um, the fact that he cycles his extra turn as well on the A3 makes, makes his kit just even more valuable. He gets around to those, those important skills really quickly. He brings your leap so you don't have to have life still everywhere. Like It just brings so much to the table early on. Dimitha, as, as we just spoke about there, really starts to come online when you may be six weeks into the game and you're starting to progress a bit more in clan boss. You're starting to build out a bit of a wider roster for even things like dungeons and stuff. So I, I think Dimitha, albeit she might be the stronger champion, I don't think she gives you as much value until you start getting a bit further into the game. You know, Deacon from day one is just like Ennis, honestly. He's going to help you push your campaign. He's doing like, it's just it, nowhere in the game that he's not going to help you. Right. Whereas Dimitha, if, you, if she was like the first person you leveled out to six star because you thought she's such a great epic, well, she's probably not helping you get anywhere. You know, it would be an awful mistake to take Dimitha to six star as your first champion. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, and, and when you do get her online, she becomes the, the all encompassing support, really. She's cleansing things, she's healing you, she's blocking damage for you. So, she's extending buffs. Like, she's just a great support champion, but she doesn't enable you to, to progress through the basics, I'd, I'd say. She becomes more of a, you know, a, a next tier in terms of understanding of the game before you can really make it easier. Yeah, and you know, listening to you describe that, uh, it occurred to me that, you know, you've been playing the game basically since it came out. I've been playing for about three years now. And so when we say, you know, it takes about six weeks to get Demitha online, that's for us. That's for experienced yeah, players yeah, who are, you know, if we're doing an HH challenge or something, it's like, okay, I need about six weeks to get the gear and build the team around her and get her into a place where I'm, I'm comfortable with her. But if you're a new player, it might take double that at least. Yeah, Do you know true. what I mean? It could be the kind of thing yeah, yeah. where if you don't really understand how to tweak a champion and how to get the most out of them, if you've never run a champion like Demitha before, it's a little bit trickier to figure out. And I think Deacon is actually less tricky to figure out, right? Like he's, he's more yeah. straightforward yeah, yeah. and he's going to yeah. empower the rest of your roster more than she will. Um, so it almost sure. doesn't, yeah. you know, I, I, I think, and, and let me ask you this. Like, I think that Deacon works with everybody. Like, that's, I feel like no matter what roster you pull, like, no matter what your shards look like, he's going to work with whatever you've got. I mean, do you feel yeah. like when you've taken him as a starter code, there's ever a composition, like a, a roster that you put together where you're like, oh, yeah, Deacon's not working early on. He's not working in the mid game. I'm just going to take him out. No, no, he, he will stay in your teams probably like at least for a year. Uh, yeah, I'd say at least a year until you start to just you get more specialists that then fill in roles. But even then, he's probably still finds a place in somewhere. But yeah, he's he's staying in everywhere, and, and he really is like you say, he's straight out the tin. You understand what's going on. Um, whereas someone like a Demitha is much more, just way more complex in terms of the way you would use her, yeah. and um, which makes this quite an interesting one because. You know, almost like once you're past a few months into the game, I think the Mitha is better. Like, I, like it, she would bring more value to your team once you get that understanding and the knowledge. But until you've got it, I think she'll probably be a hindrance. Like on my website, for example, you know, we rate people, we rate these different champions, and sometimes we probably lead people down the wrong path because the Mitha will be rated really highly. So someone will pull a Demitha and they'll be like, oh, brilliant, I've got this Demitha, she's got a great rating. I'll six-star her next. And unfortunately, what we can't do on, on our rating system is say, you know, what's your experience level? How many right. six-stars have you already got? You know, who have you got alongside them? Like, if because you kind of need to answer those questions before you decide who you should six-star next, right? Yeah. And Demitha probably gets six-starred in situations where people just don't understand how to use her, when to use her, you know, why to use her. Whereas... Like you say, Deacon, you can just throw in and be very confident that six starring is that's never a wrong decision. Right. So um, it's a real tricky one. Yeah. All right. So I, I'm going to actually ask you here to make a call. If you had to go one way or the other, who do you think is going through or who do you think should go through? Whichever you prefer. Yeah. I, so 
I think Deacon's probably going to go through, uh, through to the final. But I actually think Demitha is the stronger champion out of the two. So, and, and it's awkward because, like we said there, like if I pulled Deacon in the first three months, he's definitely the stronger pick. But for the longevity of an account, I think Demitha is the better champion. What's, it's interesting because, it, well, even in the conversation, it feels like that shifted a know. little bit because early on you were like, you know, Deacon, even at the end game, is usable and he, he is, right? Well, he, he will... is, but he's, he's not as much of a specialist. Right. Like, right. And I so value the... specialists more late. And if I think, who do I use? I still use Demitha right. on my main account. And yeah. Yeah, my main account is stacked with a you know, silly amount of legendaries, plus this, plus that. Like, so the fact that I still use her says to me that she's extremely valuable as an epic. You, you know Whereas the um the little don't use. You know the little video review we get every year where they tell you, you know, like what you've done on your account? Yeah. Yeah. And they tell you your top five most used champions. Deacon's still in my top five most used champions. Is he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of crazy. Now I have Demitha and I've built her for Clan Boss and I don't currently use her because I use a Helicath instead. Um right. But I would like to unlock Helicath and put her in. Um, yeah. But I, I feel like. I feel like what you said is true, that she's. As a solution for one particular problem, she's about as good as it gets in this game. Right. Yeah. She is that tier of solution. And the fact that she's an epic just makes her all that more accessible. Um, whereas Deacon, I don't think, is ever that level of solution, but he can factor into so many different solutions. Oh, definitely. That yeah. it's really about, you know, do you value versatility versus that that power, like you were saying, calling her that powerful champion, which I, I think she is. And honestly, I didn't originally think she was going to get to the final four. But as this has progressed, it feels right that she is here. Um, and again, I'm leaning Deacon. You're leaning to Mitha. I like that. Yeah, that, that's it. That, I like that. That's it's not clear. <laughs> it's not that clear. It's, not, you know. it's definitely not. It, yeah, it really and, and is so about personal preference. On, yeah. Yeah. Time and game. Who else you've got? All that type of stuff. So. It's right. a really interesting set, uh, final, actually. I like that yeah. semi-final. All right, well, let's head over to the east side of the bracket. We'll go to the northeast first. This is the Dragon's Lair. And this is the quadrant of the bracket that just went haywire. This got broken instantly. If you look back, you haven't seen it for a while, but, you know, Runekeeper Dazdurk yeah. got knocked out right away. We had an upset where Mistrider Dathi Pulled a couple of upsets in a row, knocking out White Triad Naya and then Duke the Pierce, which I was astonished Ooh, by. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And as a result here in the Epic Eight, we actually ended up with Royal Guard from the nine seed up against Maneater. Now, I think nobody's super surprised that Maneater got to this spot. Royal Guard was a little bit of a surprise to some people. What do you feel about Royal Guard's appearance here in the Epic Eight? Does he deserve to be there? I think he does. I think he's just been, it's just been like that consistent epic champion since I've played the game that's always got into teams. You know, every time they've, they've kind of released the next set of dungeons and, you know, the next format of, of the game, he already, always seems to find a way into teams. And even now, for me, he's in teams. You know, he's still in my, I think he's still in my Dark Fate team. Um, you know, he got himself into some big hydra teams before that all kind of like shifted so i do get why he's there and I, I think if you pull a royal guard at any point in the first year you're delighted that you pull pulled guard yeah I, I think i think that's an awesome pull any max hp champions they're just so fun because you're just like suddenly you start to get these big damage numbers that you didn't have before so i, I get it i totally get it as far as damage dealers go maybe maybe Royal Guard just has more of a reputation or maybe because he is usable in Hydra and Dark Fey, two challenging areas uh, of content. Maybe he's just valued a bit more highly. But then, yeah. despite the fact that this was a relatively close uh, quarterfinal here, Maneater goes through with the 54%. Now, we were just talking about Demitha, right? And Maneater is one of those epics that is... Yeah. Oh, we just lost your green screen there. Okay, that's better. Um, that's better. Yeah, so, so Maneater is one of those unkillable epics, uh, you know, and so also very valuable. Before Demitha came into the game, obviously was the number one desired epic in yes. terms of, you know, yeah. getting that clan boss going. 
Do you think what we're seeing here is the value of clan boss in this final four? I think so. Yeah, I think it's it's huge to people to get that ultra nightmare clan boss going. You know, you get so many good rewards for it. It's, it's basically your it basically unlocks future fusion. It unlocks you know as many shard pools as you can get for free. I would say, which is a fun part of the game, and I can see why it's happened. All right, so with Man Eater coming through this round and Demitha on the other side of the bracket, do you think what we're seeing here is that the viewers really value Clan Boss? I think, I think, yeah, there is a bit of that. So I think Clan Boss, certainly getting Ultra Nightmare or Nightmare Clan Boss unlocked early is really helpful. You know, being able to get a ton of resources starting to come in regularly, things like shards, basically unlocking fusions for the future. All of those things are really important. And I think these two epics in particular, do that really well i will say with man eater though like he's way more versatile like he's just going to tons of areas of the game and you use his turn meter steel you use his uh, aoe decrease attack uh he's got the unkillable obviously he's got the block debuffs which makes him really valuable in a lot of doom tower content so for me man eater just brings tons more to other areas of the game but he doesn't really get the credit for it because he's so good at clan boss he kind of just gets like swiped into clan boss before people really appreciate how good he is. I actually remember doing Action Wars for the first time, and Manita was just so valuable in that. I actually took him out of my clan boss team, gave him some accuracy so that he could still turn Mita, and pushed him into my, my Faction War team just to get through it. And yeah, he's just, he's huge, honestly, in tons of areas of the game. Interestingly enough, because I don't run Maneater anymore, but I did for a while, is in yeah. this rotation, rotation of Centranos, there is a Scarab boss that I think you can use Ogren in, and I didn't really sure. have anybody, and so I just put two, my two man-eaters, who used to be built for clan boss, <laughs> I put them in, in Blood Shield rings, and the Scarab yeah. boss never got a turn. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, was, but... it was absolutely fantastic, it was a super easy, you know, I think I had a speed lead, somebody who had a speed aura in with them, and it was just three champions, and I, I worked through it in like three minutes, and it was great. Nice. so yeah, yeah. So no, even, definitely, even definitely. there he does he does work yeah and i think because it's a steel the turn meter which is quite rare actually he actually cycles back to it really quick right um so yeah i i, I think i think i can understand why he's gone through ahead of royal guard you know, in terms of versatility royal guard's kind of like the fun option man eater's probably the sensible option there out of the two um but i would probably go with man eater myself i think just it just unlocks too much so let's take a look now in the southeast. This is the Fire Knights Castle region. And yeah. one of my favorite champions here is Seeker. I absolutely love Seeker. He was the first Seeker's epic great. I ever built on my main account. And he does all sorts of cool things. He's one of those unique champions to the game where basically he does a thing that no other champion, no legendary does. Um, yeah. But only 12% here against <laughs> Geomancer. Not a surprise to me that Geo went through. Tell me, what do you think about this 12%? Is it too high? Is it too low? Is it what we should expect? Well, I really feel like Seeker's kind of similar to Deacon in a way. Like he's, he's doing that. He's basically enabling teams that otherwise wouldn't be possible. And I think 12% is shockingly low. <laughs> like, but he's also really good in other areas as well. Like Arena, he, he enables a go second team, which again is, is valuable to a lot of players. 12% is shockingly low, but then, I mean, Geomancer is basically a legendary champion. Like, for, for what he brings, for the unique ways that he does damage, it's basically legendary. So, I understand why he went through. And actually, looking at some of the previous rounds here, he has just demolished some big hitters. Like, we spoke about Seer earlier, but 70 30 against Seer. Yeah. 83% against Venomage is right. also pretty shocking. Like, he's actually taken out a load of brilliant epics along the way. Um, but yeah, Seeker, it's probably the right, oh, it's definitely the right choice. I think Geo might have been my overall winner when I went through and did my picks. But um, yeah, damn, that's, a, that's an absolute whitewash in, in the previous round there. I, I think one of the things about Geomancer that is so tricky for this bracket is that it almost doesn't matter what CD is. It almost doesn't matter who he comes up against. He's one of those champions people are really excited to get. 
They yeah. use him a lot. He's got versatility. He's got power. He's kind of got the whole package. And as a result, I think some of the conversations about his matchups almost don't go very far. People are like, oh, it's just Geo. It's just Geo. Just vote him through. Yeah, and for instance, yeah. I, I thought the Geo Venomage conversation was really interesting because I think Venomage is another powerhouse that can really carry right. an account. Exactly. Yeah, in a lot yeah. of places. And only seeing 17% there from Venomage almost feels like people didn't want to have the conversation. They didn't want to think about Venomage. Um, and, you know, I get it. I get the Geo's going through. I expect him to be in the final. Um, I definitely predicted that he would go through. Uh, but yeah. I think the percentages that we're seeing maybe don't represent the his opponents as well as maybe the conversation should. No, I agree. I agree. It, the thing is, when they... Uh, sorry, when you look at Geomancer, so every year I do a best teams in raid and basically pull from the optimizer the the fastest teams, you know, the, the most used champions, all that type of stuff. And last year, not this year, but last year before we saw some crazy power creep, I mean, Geo was in a ton of the most used teams for high-end content. But, you know, he's in a ton of them because his mechanics are just so different. It's, it's like, yeah, it's just like giving every champion that you own in that team an extra chance to hit with Warmaster. Right. Like, it's nuts. Like, the, the ability when it was, you know, so-called nerfed or changed or whatever, was absolutely like, it, it should never have gone through the way it went through. I think it was a mistake, but, <laughs> but it just makes him so valuable in, in late game content. So I totally get it. I, I totally get why he's there. And I, I understand the way he's just kind of like demolishing the field. It really shows how valuable they think he is. Like players think Geomancer is. And, and I get it. You know, I, I think he's probably... He would be my number one epic to pick if I could just say, you know what, I just want to grab a, an epic that's going to help me once I've played the game for a couple of months already. Right. He's a bit like Dimitri in that way. Like, you don't want to level him up as your first champion. He will get you nowhere. Yeah. But once you've got a solid team around you, then Geomancer starts to just move you forward, like, substantially. There are champions. There are more of them. And Duke the Pierce not making it, you know, like Runekeeper Dazder losing in the first round. I, I feel like top 10 is no longer a number. It's a category. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. these are my top 10 champions and there are 22 of them. You know, because yeah, that's exactly that. <laughs> and that's, times I've made that video. I've written out the list and I'm like, right. I need to cut some of these, these champions out. And then, you know, just all the comments start coming in. Why isn't this, this champion on there? And I'm like, well, who's coming out? <laughs> who's coming off the list right. for them? Yeah, yeah. I've done that many times. Yeah. Right. So if we, if we looked at this Epic 8, you know, you look at these eight champions. These are eight fantastic champions. But if you think that there's a champion yeah. who should have belonged in the Epic Eight, first of all, like just pick any champion who didn't make the Epic Eight in the field. Who do you think should have gotten to this round? Who do you think should have made the quarterfinals that did not? I mean, it's really difficult. Like, pretty much a bunch of the ones that were in the round before are in the mix. Definitely, I think, I feel like Sears should have been in the eight. Seer should have been in but the she, eight, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But she went out in, like, the second round. Yeah. Um, so, but, but now we have that question. Who do you knock out, right? Like, if you want to yeah. bring Seer in, who do you knock out? And it's hard. It's really hard. Like, I would probably knock Stack Knight out, but... Yeah. He's so good. He's, <laughs> he's so, so good. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very hard. It's, incre it's, it's almost impossible, honestly, to do it. Like and, you say, they're just good at different things. That, that's the cool thing about Raid. Why raid actually has, has kept going for so long yeah. is it's like well what are you doing what do you want that champion to do and that's the only way you can really create the the answer you know, it's like what are you doing and what are you supporting that champion with or who are they going to support yeah. and then i can tell you who the top 10 is or you know it's, it's and even then it's just my opinion versus yours you know it's that's why raid has have created a really good game yeah. um because there is such a cool amount of versatility with champions and they also enable you to build champions so differently depending on gear sets you use, depending on the masteries you build. And I don't feel like there's been another game that's really touched them in that way in terms yeah. of that kind of like depth of build for the same champion. So um, that's yeah, your challenge for Fateless there. For yeah, well, that's exactly one of our kind of like pillars is depth. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's making sure that we don't add complexity where we don't need it but we do want to add 
cool amount of depth to the to the way you build champions because I think that's probably Raid's like biggest strength. You know, it's it's, just, they've done it so well. It's not easy to accomplish. No, no, not at all. Yeah. No, already yeah. we're actually going through skill kits right now. And it's like, <laughs> it's, does this feel too strong? Does this feel, you know, it's, right. it's like we're already going through that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's tough. It, it's funny too, because like when I asked you the question, I knew no matter what answer you gave, no matter what champion you picked and what champion you knocked out, there are going to be some viewers who are like, no, you're crazy. <laughs> like, definitely. That's yeah. exactly can't, it. You can't win. <laughs> you can't win. It yeah, does come down to per perspective. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so looking definitely. at, at this final forward matchup, this this semifinal here, we've got Maneater and Geomancer. Geomancer is just a buzzsaw here. Do you think Maneater has a chance at going through? Is he valuable enough? Is he considered powerful enough to take on what has to be probably the favorite in the bracket? Yeah, so I think... I, I do think there's a bit of perspective here in terms of what level are the voters at? Right, so if I think to myself, who do I want, Maneater or Geomancer? Well, Man Eater unlocks the one thing which I really need to unlock to get progression, to get shards, to get books, all of that stuff, which is Clan Boss. And Geo doesn't, Geo helps with Clan Boss, but he doesn't unlock Clan Boss. So that's the only way I think Man Eater is going to win. Is if people are looking at this in terms of, okay, we really want to pick someone who's just going to unlock probably the best content in the game, Man Eater wins like hands down. But if you're, if you're choosing the best epic out of the two, I just feel like Geo is in so many teams that it's, it's so hard not to pick him. I would pick Geo. I, I, I would pick Geo for sure. I, I, but, um, one of the funny what's things your is, view? What's your view on this one? Uh, I agree. I think Geo has to go through. Um, if for no other reason than I think he is harder to replace uh, in. Yeah. In some ways, in some content, or not so much that he's harder to replace. I think you can solve everything that Geo solves with other solutions. But that A3 that you were talking about is unique. And that yeah. provides you an opportunity to get a lot of value out of that one skill. And you don't have to have a man eater. You can have a Demitha. You can have a Helicath. We've talked about some other options there. Um it, it was kind of funny. Just this week, I was looking at various clan boss speed tunes, and there is actually a speed tune with these four champions that you can use. Like okay. this, final, <laughs> this final four goes right. into a speed tune that works, actually. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, but I do think that as valuable as clan boss is, um, I don't think Maneater is as popular as he used to be because there have been more options introduced. Uh, yeah. You know, even even the addition of Emic and Alsgor in the last year, right? Adding a two more unkillable champions there, um, and then I still think the one thing that is you know always going to be Maneater's downfall is that five turn cooldown. Um, that's just a little bit frustrating to players to have to work around. Um, I, I so do I, think though that I think, his, yeah. his speed tunes are easier to do. Like if you think about Clan Boss and yeah. Now it sounds I get questions about people trying to build Demitha teams and it fell out of sync and you know, the debuffs were going in the wrong place, all this sort of stuff. I get less of that with man eater teams. Just I think because the block debuff goes out and generally they're easier to build. Yeah. But still, and I agree. I agree with you. I'm just saying, like I yeah. feel like man eater's just for the average player, he's just a bit easier to use. Now, even if you're not building him into a proper speed tune and you, you pick him up and you put him in your clan boss, I feel like he still does a lot of work for you, even if you don't speed tune him right and all that type of stuff. Whereas if you don't speed tune Demitha right, or, you know, I think she's way less value. You know, she, she'll bring way less value to you. Yeah. Just because it's on the, you know, the one turn buff rather than the, the two. But, um, and the block debuffs just brings so much. I don't know, man. It's, it's so hard. Like, <laughs> no, you're right there. I, I actually think the block debuff buff is one of those extra values that you get out of Maneater. Like the, the people don't even really appreciate. You don't think about it that yeah. much. But on the unkillable, you get a block debuff buff for two turns, which allows you to go full auto, full affinity friendly in clan yeah. boss. But also you can use in all of the other content where he's also great, like Spider, right? He's got yeah, the turn exactly. meter decrease. Yeah. Now he's got the block debuff for the Spiderlings. Uh, he's got the unkillable as well. So yeah, a great champion. I would, if if by some stretch he got through to the finals, 
I don't think I would feel too bad about that. I just don't see it happening. <laughs> no, it, but you know what? For me, I feel like Man Eater versus Geomancer. For me, that's the final. Oh yeah, I I, I think both of those champions are better than um, the two from the other side. That's just pers- That's my personal. But, so whoever is coming uh, out of the East is going to win the whole thing. I think so. That's my view. <laughs> All right. So that was going to be my next question then. Um, you know, if okay. we're calling this round for Geo, you think you think Geo? I mean, I think coming into this, everybody thought Geo was the favorite. Do you think the favorite just runs away with it and it doesn't even matter who shows up on the other side? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I was surprised. So actually, he was the second favorite behind Godseeker coming into it, right? In terms of actual your rankings here. So uh, yeah. He well, so. So here's the thing that remember that we took the voting from the in-game system, the review system, and that's how we created the seating. So he, oh, he yeah, is a I second see seed here. He's at, he was actually, I think, something like the sixth or seventh overall ranked champion. Um, like, yeah. yeah, so which is, you know, kind of surprising. But I think despite that, you know, here at Cold Red Plays, like when we were talking about it, it's like, yeah, he's got to be the favorite. He has to be. Right. OK. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I mean, I do think he's the one to beat. I, I, I'd be surprised if he doesn't end up walking away as number one. For me. I think so too. He's, he's I, the, yeah. Yeah, go on. I, I, I voted for Deacon. Because I went snowball champion. I went early game champion. I went the champion that empowers all of the other champions because that's what I value. Um, sure. But yeah, I, I'm not going to be surprised if it's Geo. I, I would be surprised if it were Demitha, but I also think that could be really cool, you know, because she is one of those champions. Yeah. It's just another unique champion that enables, another epic champion that enables something that even legendaries can't, which is sure. really cool when you see that, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 All right. It's, so uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So let me, let me ask you, um, you know, in terms of the conversations of these champions, was there anything that during this process, or maybe even during like this year's HH challenge, if you're you know referencing one of these champions in the 64, like any anything, did you learn anything? Was there a champion that really rose in your estimation through this process, or maybe somebody that you gave a second try to that you originally didn't think was going to be valuable, and now you're finding more value in them? I mean, definitely in the HH challenge. So I think because I pulled a Dithy early and hadn't really used one before. I think he's risen in my estimations a lot. Someone who I, I don't know if he's even in the mix, actually, who I had last year, which was Skimfoss. I knew it. He was like game changer for me last year. Like absolute game changer in terms of pulling an epic. And I was just kind of like, oh, okay, that's not too bad. He like totally turned my free to play around last year yeah. in terms of being able to beat content that I couldn't beat before. And he was like just solo, turn me to controlling a whole bunch of stuff. You know, he's got the decreased speed, he's got the full turn me to steal. So I don't think he featured at all here he, from what he I didn't make see, the list. No. Which is and crazy. You, but yeah. You know what's really funny is last year, so I did the challenge last year and I yeah. watched your video on Skimfos. I had never pulled him before. I'd never built him before. And literally right. like two days after your video, I pulled him. And okay. I built it. Yeah. I built yeah. him because you had put out that video, and I was like, "Oh, this guy's this guy's fantastic." Yeah, you know, it's really and good. yeah, yeah. So I I do think when you look at the the entire field of sixty four, it's the same thing where we're like, you know, can you pick your top ten? You know, it's like it's really hard because there are like seventeen champions that belong there. It's the same with the top sixty four. There are another ten champions or fifteen champions you could <laughs> easily say belong in this field that didn't make it. I mean, the fact that Inquisitor Shamil didn't make it is in you know crazy that's crazy yeah high, high is katoon crazy. is not in the top 64 which i think is absurd you know and then skimfos yeah. is another great champion um so yeah it, it does feel like you know the top 64 really should have about 80 or 90 champions <laughs> yeah I, I remember i did a challenge with deadwood like a clan boss challenge but it was epics only yeah and i remember subbing in last minute morag morag um you know the ally attack uh dwarf and she absolutely changed that team. Like I went from being a bit of a contender to an absolute winner because Morag just gave me a ton more damage, a ton more survivability. So again, it, it kind of depends on situation, depends on team comps that you're running. But 
Epics can just come in and, and do a lot of work if, if they've got the right setting to do it. Yeah. And that's what's, again, that's what's cool about this game. You know, someone like a Morag, I'd actually rated her quite lowly on the, the website. And I ended up like trying her out. And I was just like, oh, what have I done? <laughs> like, she's really good. She hits really hard as well. So yeah, there's just a few like that where you're thinking, you know, they're great epics, but in the right situation. Yeah, and Morag was one of those, uh, I think, fan favorites that people were really disappointed got knocked out in the first round. Um, so many people were like, no, she should be going all the way to the finals. Um, and, and it is, you know, like you said, dependent upon when you get them and where you put them and how you use them. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you have a favorite epic? Like, do you have one that you just love, you know, for whatever reason, you just have an emotional attachment to that you would prefer to play with, you know, on any account? Oh, interesting, yeah. Um... I guess I guess I really enjoy so I've always enjoyed clan boss and you know if I'm looking for like teams to build that type of stuff I really love Barak in the fat I think he brings a ton he brings a ton of utility a ton of damage for your teams I use him in tons of areas as well like certainly in early accounts so he would be up there for me I, th I think probably though like for someone who's quite unique and really cool I actually really like a Ken a Kempton and what mm -hmm. he does. Like his kit's totally different. He when he came in, he was just like a bit of a game changer. He's got the ability to smash his way through waves of enemies in quite a unique way. The way he's he interacts with um gear sets is is pretty unique as well. So I think he he was designed and, and it's quite fun. But yeah, again, depends on situation, you know. <laughs> yeah. Do you, by the way, do you? I have several. I mean, as a dedicated free-to-play player, I've had so many playthroughs where I've gotten epics that have changed my account. Um, so if we kind of set aside Deacon and, you know, some of the, the top, top champions, um, I think I really like high-utility champions, high-utility supports, or somebody who, like, you can plug in and just solves problems for you, like a Doom Priest. I love Doom Priest. Sure. You know, whenever yeah. I pull her, I build her and I just like putting her in stuff. I'm actually becoming very fond of Ruella because she brings a lot to a kit yeah, um, and solves some problems. Um, but I would think, you know, the one that I probably have um, a soft spot, spot for who I don't really play that often, but I did on my main account is Paidma. Um, she's, you know, oh, okay. she's, she's been power crept, but she's still a great champion. She hits really hard. She's a defensive based damage dealer, so you can build her really tanky. Talk about that 100% AOE decrease A1, uh, yeah. decrease attack A1. She's got that. She's got a, a buff steal, um, and she's got a pretty good nuke. So, yeah, I, I just got a soft spot for Pedma, I think. Yeah, I guess my, like my early epic that I pulled, early void, was Skull Crown. And yeah. she was like my first epic, which totally carried my account. Uh, yeah. And I remember just thinking, I can't wait to get Sonatia because she pairs with her. But... Really, Skull Crown was just so good. And, and I used it right the way through to, to the point where we were doing those, um, I can't remember the term now, the arena teams where you're just like smashing through people. The blenders? Anyway, her, yeah, blenders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I ended up using her a ton over the course of my account. But yeah, I, I mean, now she's been power crept to oblivion, really. But still, really fun one to pick up early on. You yeah, know, and definitely. Do some work with, yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Hell Hades, for coming on the channel and talking epics. So, the voting is open for the next round for the finals. Hell Hades, you can go and vote too. That'd be great. And then we're going to get to yeah, see we'll where the where the brackets stand because I think you know one of the things that I was expecting to happen is that the brackets would be updated with every vote, but that hasn't happened. So we don't actually get to find out who is leading in the bracket race until after the uh, the final comes through. So make sure to go and vote. You can click on the link in the description of this video. Also, go check out Hell Hades' channel. If you haven't, I'll put a link to your, your Fateless channel, your main channel, your Thank website. You. He's got a lot of resources, all of the best in, uh, in the world of Raid. Thanks so much, Hades. You got anything to say uh, to people so before we go? Well, just um, make sure you vote. Like, this has been really fun, actually. Like, I guess I came in at the start, and now I'm kind of picking it back up towards the end. I actually want to... Uh, there must be a way that I saw... I can see my original votes. Is there? Yes. Like, yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's there's a link in your email where you can look at your original bracket. Cool. Okay. So yeah, um, I need to go back and check and see how it's done versus like how, how these have actually like performed. But yeah. really cool initiatives. So yeah, it's awesome, man. All right.
Well, thanks so much. I've been Colred. That's Hell Hades, and we will see you in another video soon.